2222, Montmartre, Paris. Sunset grows smaller, spaces settles to layers, pinches of light are smothered, dust deteriorates and swells, the timer ticks, dust draws on. Thank you. This is by the, uh, the incredible Fernando Smith. It's called No Future, No England Dreaming. The idea drained, the river forgot to dream. A dancing rap replaced our will. A concert in a football stadium bunged our ears. I sold my garden. The rich man built a fence around it. I was locked out of the house. Adam and his Eve stranded deep in enemy territory. We sat outside the fence, kicking every stray dog that passed. Even our violence was taught to children. Memory colonised, now I wear an ironic t-shirt and when they sing, then that's my song. Thank you. I was really uh, honoured when uh, Nick uh, asked me quite a long time ago now if I'd read this poem at this event. This is a poem called Unthanks. Bright tonic light opens on a box church in the stirred ribbons of the lowlands. A sandstone scramble to a gorsed rampart. Map words read ho, fum, ho. You can't find where you are, and when you reach the top, there is no space left to sign your name in the rust on the landmark. Bereaved in dream, we lost her in dream. I cried sore, but accepted and learned through grieving and hated myself on waking. Rain, sun, come to your senses in the English darkness. Hear the bittering morse of the stars. We are still, all still, together in the English dark. Slip into the rooms of your children. What is it they do when they are not breathing? Mud up, churned along the earthenware roadside. Teasel clouds, tenebrous grasses make up the land's sad timbre. Its tissue paper voice. The only words it knows were all forged differently ago. Time and ice distend the echo in her heart and the holes in your memory. Out in the fecund dark, she started knocking, and she was born three days after the swallows came. The sun unpicks the frost stitches. The lamb's blood creeps back a finger tip at a time. On the ruins, the freeze and the thaw are not gentle, but just slow. The armies sucked into the soil are scattered by the plowshare, and every rotting soldier dreams his dream alone. Clarinet and light, Debussy morning, the girl's laughter is tethered to the seat. You are pulled across the lawn towards the light in your bare feet, drinking up the cold through your calloused souls. These are the hinges, other knowings swing on them. And this photograph is of me, higher than that, in song flight, shot against the stronger light, 
I am Skylark. I am a fist of pipits bouncing like dice. I am limits out of song reach. You only need to eke it back by note, by stunted prayer to the warmer months. Imagine that you had not walked by birches. There would be no birches. Fragility is too complex for us, like imagining that there are no birches. The dog rose slips of bristle stiff in the untrimmed verges, cocksure of their value. This is the faith you lack in the maleness of God. The roots get closer when you bring your children home. Wagtail, wagtail, what is that knocking on the door? Wagtail, wagtail, when you bring your children home, the roots get closer. Woke, cried out the last dry blood in the fog shifts of night, trawled the air with clawed hands for the something there to be snared. Surrender your daughter to her sleeps, with the corners of her fingers, working her fingers. All our cries are plaited together. Now without, deep scrub, untended, deep scrub, the colour of flint. A weak sun nurses the punched bruise of the heath. Now without, sleep. Sleep. They are with us, those that went, long, long before they're going, and they shimmer even in the night light. I know a province of stolen Roman stone, the banked earth scabbed over quarries, abandoned earthworks, raised homes, undistinguished temples, the moneyed and the prosaic. Here too, there were always children, and the fitful sleep of those children in the borrowed lands where your mothers and fathers closed their eyes. Thank you all for staying here. Icarus, it will never be ours. Lost to the light, the thought and the rock, trying to lip read to apes, to learn to lie to the rocks, singing, they stand on them. who moved ever westward. I am the shepherd who lived in the mountains, keeping his flock from the Romans. I am the farmer raising the crops while Angles, Saxons and Danes fight for the lands of the south. I am the adventurer come from Normandy to fight for one Scottish king against the rest. I am Lancashire. I am the borders. I am Fife. I am Wales. I am France. I am Scandinavia. I am the Caucasus. Ultimately, I am Wales. I am France. I am Scandinavia. I am Africa. This is British. Part of all of Europe, no indigenous origin for us. We borrow from all, like our language, so rich and diverse because we have already robbed, stolen, purloined and grabbed words from everyone we meet. So this is our history, where we may be an edge of Europe, but we mix within us all the peoples of Europe and beyond. Now on my watch in this island story, we find something new, a fear, a wanting to be other, to leave the outside world behind, to wallow in a nostalgia for something that was never real. We have developed, just maybe not fast enough. 
We've picked up much from our neighbours to make our social life and diet much more varied and enjoyable. We may have failed at the final hurdle of being comfortable in our skin and comfortable with the people living amongst us. For people to find a safe haven here in our fells and valleys to be welcomed for what they bring, not feared for being different. Now we have a task of our own, to turn away on this isolating path. We have to embrace cooperation. See that our future lies working with the rest of Europe to forge a sustainable society for this century. Our struggles we will make less bloody than those of the past century. They will be epic and even glorious as we pull the world back from the brink fossil fuels have brought us to. That is the grand <coughs> task for us to be part of. This is a poem by Tony Hendry, and it's called In Lyon. At the Boite à Café Moxa in Lyon, a waiter explains with only a hint of disdain that I want a café long, not an Americano. At the next table, a chic couple smile at my faux pas. To foster pan-European friendship, I wish to tell all three how our cities are tied for their Leon is Lugdunum, and my remote Carlisle is Lugvalium. Both were named by Roman colonists for Lu, a Celtic god revered by locals. He is a sun god, a bringer of light, Apollo and Helios by another name. Below Fisher Street, or Rue Saint Jean, his broken altars await discovery. Confluence is historical, etymological, Literal. Rhone and Saon meet in Leon, Eden and Colju by Carlisle's castle, and both of our cities were savaged through ages by implacable floods. Like our stories, most of my French is washed away. Not enough survives to tell waiter and couple any of this, so I close my eyes to watch again the play of sunlight on soil and rivers. This is Love Is by Nick Robinson. I only got it this morning, so I'll do my best. <laughs> Love is a strong word, perhaps the strongest word we possess in language. A word transcending beyond language, entering into another sphere of existence entirely. We are fascinated by the word, trying in vain to capture its essence, its very spirit delve into our own fragile experiences to extract hidden gold, but just as we feel that we have closed our metaphoric fingers around it, our emotions rise up, tugging at our heartstrings, presenting other elements to be classified as love, and so it continues. Perhaps this is why we love it so. It will always be beyond our understanding, ahead of our emotional intellect, an impossible task to undertake as we, are very, as we are the very cornerstone of the emotion, too close to encapsulate it in full. So here we are in this quandary, this love soup. Instead of trying to explain the impossible, let me turn to what I know and love. I have a love affair, not only with my partner, but with a place. Its very character sends me into a kind of rapture. Its snow-capped peaks so high they melt seamlessly into the sky. Its features so bold, every mountain town or ground-out coombe becomes a majestic object of beauty, a minor masterpiece in their own right. <coughs> this place, of course, is Lakeland, and like love, it fills me with a multiple waves of wonderment and intrigue. Here in Lakeland, a land not so very far away, the stresses of life sink away until they're hidden beyond thought, beyond memory, and it's only when I leave that these feelings return. I feel a part of the landscape, away from the crowds, away from the talk and tittle tattle that fill my days. Here, in Lakeland, I have been cleansed, like I have bought into something wholesome, 
a free place of nature and tranquility. I hear the sheep bleating and the wind, but nothing else. It is so quiet as the sun caresses my skin, and a feeling has eclipsed my heart too. Here there are no distractions from the sheer sublimity that paralyse my senses. When I walk alone, in the quiet, I can fully focus not only on the marvels of nature that stand before me, but retreat deep into thought as well. The landscape somehow aided my imagination and capacity for concentration. It is here, on the roof of the world, that I have somehow gained superhuman abilities. And it is here I dwell a while, knowing that this feeling is only fleeting. I spy from my high location other mountains, and beyond them more again. They feel to me like waves coming in from the sea, overlapping, and continue as far as the eye can make out. There is a sense of timelessness generated by them, stretching far and beyond. The connection with infinity, I think, branching out into outer space and the unknown. As I look out across the range of mountains, I realise that I do not know these fells at all. And even though I have climbed them, their hearts remain untouched and unblemished. It is then that I realise that, like love, I have not grasped this magical place at all. Too close, too emotionally involved to quantify my love for them. This is called recasting. You have realised now that you are afraid you will never have children of your own, that taking a bullet for somebody else's child is not the same thing as love. And though you have no rings, no family heirlooms, save the gin bottles, the dresses your mother wore before you were born, a chain of women reaching through the years, holding out their empty hands, that there is freedom in slow decline and time to leave instructions, that they do not bury you in a coffin, but rather a sack like a cocoon, the way archaeologists find Neanderthal grave sites, with the deceased left carefully in fetal positions, and tell your father not to stand at the back of the service like an illegitimate son. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right, um, um, just in case, um, this poem is called Wind Latter, it's one of mine. Um, Wind Latter, if you don't know, is one of the conifer forests, well, it's a fell with a conifer forest on it, and the conifer forests are all I know, and it's all my parents know, and it's all my grandparents know, and it's actually what my great-grandparents know, because that particular plantation is coming up to 100 years old now, so they're not new. Um, and the deer in the corridor is actually linked to this poem because he was made from wire from Wind Latter that I found when I was watching that deer that I did the sculpture of. So, Wind Latter. I know the dark woods, discovered the vast cathedral with the wind in its roof, laid my hands on the towering columns last touched by the men who put them there. I found the oak, unseen by all but the woodsman, followed his silent steps across the white quartz beck to where the road sleep. <coughs> so um, we're going to read a short story by Ilya Trojanov. Um, and just uh, to prevent any confusion, uh, we want to let you know that there's only one narrator in the story, but we're going to share his part, so please don't be confused about that. <laughs> okay, the story is called Game for a Zoo. Building a zoo is no easy task, not for a small town out in the provinces, especially not these days. What we have to help 
Build a socialism, says the party secretary, not a zoo. There's no arguing with a man. Even if all we are talking about is a modest little pen with a few roe deer and a couple of red stags, a few peacocks, some guinea fowl, mountain goats, and maybe a limping fox. So what are the odds of getting a real zoo, the kind I imagine day after day as I wipe down the wooden tables in the restaurant, eagerly waiting for spring to arrive, or as I sweep the floor dreaming of zebras and giraffes, and even an elephant when I'm cleaning out the gutter on the roof. When the first guests sit down on the patio overlooking the lake or the beers, gaze at the craggy knolls and stretch their limbs out into the early summer, a lion scampers through my mind. I shake my head slightly, almost imperceptibly, and go on shoving kofta and kebabs the whole summer long, all the while dreaming away. Years ago, I figured out exactly where it should go, a fellow meadow stuck between two calves on the other side of the lake. Every day I look at this bright spit of land jutting out the thick forest and rising up the slopes. In summer, once the sun has gained a foothold, half the town gathers at our lake, and that half could walk around the lake and straight into my zoo, where they would just enjoy themselves. Then they could fortify themselves in the restaurant on their way back. Nor would visitors from out of town, including the high society from the capital, pass up the chance to see our zoo, even if it didn't have any lions or elephants. My dreams now know how to be patient. The restaurant gets renovated, the terrace expanded, the meadow in front of the forest keeps growing wild, and one day, for no reason at all, and not due to any pressure, the party committee decides to act on my proposal and approves an animal pen on the north side of the lake. And what a joy that they've entrusted the task to me. As it happens, I'm quite familiar with our country's wildlife. Right away, I managed to get hold of a few roe deer and one red stag, then five mountain goats a little later on. I buy a frail old dancing bear of a Roma man with a bad case of gout. By now, it's pretty impressive. The little pen with the native fauna. I plant bushes and trees, fill the water with fill the water troughs, paint a few signs, and call the vet from the provincial capital when the first roe deer gives birth. And every day I take my dream walk by the lake, never losing sight of what's still missing, of what could transform this pen into a genuine zoo. Something from very far away, something different, something like, well, for example, a giraffe. A giraffe? No problem, uncle. That from my nephew Groston, who's done amazingly well for himself. He works in a ministry in the capital and comes to visit us once a year in his official car. Uh, what do you mean, no problem? You're in luck, uncle, and your luck has a name. Sikou Touré. Sikou Touré? <coughs> no, uh, Sikou Touré. Don't you listen to the news? The baboon that stood up to the leopard, the spider that outwitted the hydra. What hyena? Hyena, <laughs> sorry. Um, de Gaulle, uncle. General Charles de Gaulle. Don't wreck your brains, it's complicated. Geopolitics. I'll tell you what you need to know. For now, just remember, we have a new friend in Africa, and pretty soon we might even have a... In Africa? Supplier. What does he supply? Giraffes, for example. Giraffes, or gnus, or gazelles. How do I know? Maybe there'll be a lion in you, uh, for you someday. A lion? I wouldn't count it out. Now that would be a zoo. With a lion there, it would be a real zoo. Let's see, uncle. Leave all the rest to me. I no longer have to wipe tabletops. Now I'm in charge of the pen and have more time for, see for thinking about the uh, hyena, the general, and my nephew. A happy coincidence. Someone from our family with connections to Africa. Serendipitous, because the fact is, giraffes don't live anywhere else. Except, 
I'm a little surprised that Grostan wants to supply toilet bowls in return for the animals. Maybe he was just joking. I don't always understand him. Most of the time he calls out of the blue and catches me completely off guard. Good news, uncle. We have a giraffe and now hang on to your seat. He won't believe it. There's also a lion. It's a bad connection. But I gather he expects me, he expects me to go to the capital to fetch the animals and accompany them to their new home. I'm amazed at the party secretary's sudden enthusiasm. He claps me on the shoulder and wishes me good luck. I take the bus to the capital and start tearing up the minute I lay eyes on the beautiful creatures. The next day the vet informs me that the lion is blind and the, and the giraffe is lame, but that doesn't dampen my joy, especially since uh, the friendly colleagues from the big zoo in the capital throw in a few zebras. A zoo has to look like a zoo, right, even if it is somewhere in the provinces. I thank them and remain grateful, even though, as the years go by, the, the, the zebras turn out to be barren. Our animals are the delight of the town, only nobody knows for sure where this guinea is. I take heart and order a gigantic carved sign, which I, I hang between the two beech trees along the lake path. <coughs> Welcome to the zoo. Not even the party secretary is convinced we need, no, sorry. Now even the party secretary is convinced we need more wildlife. The stars are aligned, the phone rings, and the heavy voice says, Da es Salam. Grostan? Da es Salam. Is that you, Grostan? How does that sound for you, uncle? Da es Salam. Sounds pretty nice, doesn't it? I'm not sure. And that's not only half of it. Niri ri Uyama. Are you talking about animals? As many as you like. Guess with whom we've just declared fraternity. How am I supposed to know Grostan? Tanzania. Serengeti! Precisely, uncle. The animal treasury of Africa is yours for, yours for the taking. Grostan has added to his repertoire. He's shipping peach compote and pickled peppers. Now and then a few crates reinforced with metal bands get mixed in with the shipments of jars and cans, but he doesn't waste words on that. The Tanzanians are even more grateful than their Guinean predecessors and reciprocate with young, healthy, frisky gazelles. Grostan gulps down his beer. He's back on home leave. I love this lake in the autumn, when everything quiets down again after the summer holidays. And the woods are so full of color. In a few weeks your gazelles will be here. I didn't have any idea how many different types there are. They asked me which kind we wanted, Grants or Thompsons or Impalas or Congoni or Dick Dicks. The list went on and on. I was amazed. And I thought that a gazelle's a gazelle, just like a deer is a deer. Hmm, that beer tastes good. Sure, we have, we have red stacks in addition to the roe deer, but that's as far as it goes. Wild boars don't really count, do they? I went for the Impala. I hope that's fine with you. The name sounded great and I also ordered a few more zebras, fertile ones this time. Otherwise, they're going to die out soon. You did well, Grostan. The zebras are the children's favorite. That's only because we still don't have any monkeys. Just let me see to that. Fortune finds me in a roundabout ways. Ever since I know how important geopolitics is for my zoo, I read the newspaper very carefully. Page 5, where the occasionally uh, uh, snippets about Africa are. Uh, the autumn has lost its gold, though I no longer have to sweep up the leaves. They foisted an experienced zoo administrator on me, but I work alongside him as deputy director. The newspaper reports on a state visit by one of our country's good friends, a man by the name of Agostino Neto. The president of the People's Republic of Angola has brought us an unusual present, a herd of baboons. We have a great use for these baboons, according to Grossman H., a high-ranking official in the Foreign Service, the article relates. 
The baboons arrive a few weeks later, just in time for the onset of winter, accompanied accompan 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 by the snippy letter from the director of the big zoo in the capital, who is baffled as to why an insignificant provincial zoo requires the whole horde while the capital is suffering from an acute baboon shortage. The monkey soon gets used to life here between the lake and the mountains. I even teach them how to throw snowballs. But the high point of my life comes in form of an unexpected telegram. Haile Selassie toppled in People's Revolution stop. Lions available stop. Rostan. <laughs> After so many decades and so many hopes and dreams, the day arrives when a proud, healthy lion steps into the zoo, the blind one having died in the August of the Prague, uh, Prague Spring. We all celebrate in the restaurant by the lake, the zoo director and the party secretary in Groston and me. After many toasts to the lions, baboons, impalas and giraffes, the party secretary practically spits into my ear. We didn't manage to build socialism, but at least your zoo got off the ground. Confused, I stare out at the cliffs. And I'm still staring at them the next day when the party secretary's drunken confession, confession is confirmed on the radio. The thought of what it might mean for my zoo gives me the shivers. Two guinea hens, hens are the first to disappear. I check all the fences and all the gates and console myself that it must be an isolated case. But soon the losses mount and it's clear I have to do something. Only what? Only what? I go to the police. I'd like to report the theft of eight peacocks, ten golden guinea fowl and six mountain goats. Do the animals belong to you? No, but they are my, they are my responsibility. I look after them. Apparently not well enough. They came in the night. And who are they? I don't know. So what do you want us to do? I... Are we supposed to procure new animals for you? Or in interrogate anyone who looks like he might have a crispy golden guinea hen in his belly? Don't say that! Old man, do you have the faintest idea the number of crimes being committed in this town ever since we've started playing at democracy? And you show up here and expect me to bother about a few runaway goats? Mountain goats. Black mountain goats. They're exceptional. So, maybe they're also exceptionally tasty. I decide to stand guard th throughout the night. I only nodded off once. The next morning, I have a headache and a bruise on my head. Four roe deer are missing. The thieves used a wire to shut the gate when they left. They're bound to be in the forest. So I spent all day traipsing through the woods. I know every nook and cranny, but I overestimate my, th my strength and collapse in a clearing. The ground is wet from melted snow. First I see ashes, then the ribcage of a goat. My heart freezes as never before. The scene before me is one of a big battlefield. Bones all around, it stings. A flayed hide is lying next to a tree and it stings. Not even Groston can help me. He's been delegated to South Africa, where his task is to make new friends as ambassador. Um, when the impalas disappear, I realize I have to take urgent action. I call the zoo in the capital. What are we supposed to do with more animals? Back then you wanted them, the baboons. Whoever that was, it must have been a long time ago. Listen, I can imagine how difficult things are for you, but we're also having a hard time keeping the animals fed. Do you think I can ask my workers to give meat to the leopards? when they've forgotten what it tastes like? And who's supposed to pay for the meat anyway? Tell me, how, how am I supposed to feed leopards without meat? All our beasts of prey look like Somalis as it is. We have a different problem. 
Here people are eating the animals. <coughs> Surely not the leopards. I don't have any leopards. Then consider yourself lucky. I make one phone call after the other, trying to reason with every director of every zoo in the country. All in vain. The gazelles vanish one by one. I share my meager pension with the old Abyssinian lion. One morning I count the, the zebras three times and each time one is missing. That's when I open all the gates and say goodbye to every last animal and then toss the keys into the lake. Then I take off through the forest one last time. I can no longer protect my zoo. Somewhere I come to a stop. I start to howl without shedding tears and in my ears it sounds like the feeble yapping of an old wolf. I sink to the ground. Now I'm on all fours and I howl and howl. I take refuge in the spirit that surrounds me. I take refuge in the spirit within me. I take refuge in the path I am traveling. I take refuge in my companions on the path. I take refuge in the spirit that surrounds me. I take refuge in the spirit within me. I take refuge in the path I am traveling. I take refuge in my companions on the path. I take refuge in the spirit that surrounds me. I take refuge in the spirit within me. <clears throat> I take refuge in my path as I travel it. And I take refuge in my companions on the path. We've heard many different voices and languages today. I'm going to add to that. This poem is written in Spanish and in English. Um, as you'll probably know, Spain is facing much the same uh, resurgence of the right um, other issues that um, they share with other European countries. Um, the part of Spain I live in uh, for half the year is a very mountainous uh, place and it's one of the few places where you can still walk and be completely alone all day. Um, I think it's not about isolation but more about being solitary and healing through being solitary. Una mujer y un paseo a solas. Woman goes for a solitary walk. Sin un compañero, mis bordes son los vecinos para del pasaje del campanilla. Este intercambio no mediaba. El choque de silencio humana no ha absorbido. El viaje en sí mismo se convierte en mi compañero. Alone, my edges neighbor the landscape my exchange unmediated, the shock of human silence unabsorbed. The journey becomes my companion. El sendero mi anima, pido a las orejas, donde es seguro cruzar. Estos son los, mis conversaciones. El largo suspiro de los pinos suena como una multitud creciente. Voy a la deriva a lo largo de la base de las montañas. Al igual que la película de actualidades. The path encourages me. I negotiate with streams. These are my conversations. The long gasp of the pines is a seated crowd rising to its feet. I drift along the base of mountains. I am newsreel. Mis pasos son amortiguados por agujas de pino. Y aun así, un cielo rojo es repente a la tarde. Estoy, estoy atondado. Sus, sus ojos te encuentran los míos, indiferente a todo excepto él. Eres mi espejo. 
diferencia todo menos a mí. Aliento, nieve llena mis pulmones, como si fueran un pozo profundo. My muffled needle strewn tread alerts a deer. It catches my overawed eye, indifferent to everything but him. He is my mirror, indifferent to everything but me. Snow breath fills the wells of my lungs. Fantasia, empathica, falacia, patetica, a quien le importa. Mis barruras no tienen una puerta de la inundación. No hay defensas. Los riachuelos están volando a través de ellos. El corazón es receptivo, las lineas están abiertas. Empathic fantasy, pathetic fallacy, who cares? The valves are gaping, the streams fly through, the heart's receptive, the lines are open. of Spain to the language of uh, around here. I've got some Cumbrian dialect in this poem because um, uh, this is where I'm from. It's called This Parlish Land. <clears throat> Learn to step lightly on the land, I tell my lad, for we are but flickering instances on this lava bed. The flish flash frisks of white, of tails, of cottons, of asses, stipple and dapple and twinkle like stars. And like the stars, this land is ancient and far-reaching and formed in a time of ice. Distant cover cousins cover the hilltops and hodden grey the fells. The saddle, scored by snow-filled paths, a lazy snail through blittered grass. We labour sizel, peltle, blash. We unlock language with a hovering lavrock's wing. We leave our fossil hall where others once have trod and feel the pull of time around us. We will return, as all return, circle our remains to rejoin ash. We are star remnants, a grimming on the ground, fallen angels. And yet, we walk among volcanoes, under glacier tracks. We are all time in a timeless land. Dots and speckles under cirrus speckled skies. We are now in an always moving then. And we step and stotter lightly in this parlish land, knowing it is ours. I'm honoured to speak the words of Nick Pemberton from a Facebook post. But it's unlike most trolling shit that you get from Facebook. It's, uh, it's really good. Not surprising it's Nick, but and it's uh, it's a response to a question, and the question is, uh, how many wars have there been between this country and parts of Europe in the last few hundred years? So Nick replies, I take the point of your question, but I think you need to make it a little more globally inclusive and try to forget about Europe. Maybe you should be asking how many wars have there been between this country and other parts of the world in the last few hundred years? After that, it might be useful to ask why there have been so many. It might also be worth bearing in mind that the place you call this country, I'm assuming you mean the United Kingdom, has only existed for about 300 years. In this context, it might be useful to forget about wars and conflicts for a moment and think about some other, perhaps more useful forms of human endeavour that, along with war, have taken place in the same time. How much scientific knowledge has been shared between nations and cultures? How many discoveries have been made and then built upon from generation to generation between scientists of different nations? How much literature translated into how many different languages? I'm not trying to win an argument, I'll prove a point here, it was. Just trying to suggest that these might be questions that are worth asking and trying to answer. Your version of who sacrificed what and how much in the Second World War leaves out way, way too much. It is an oversimplification that can, and in too many cases already has, led towards jingoism, nationalism and isolation. 
And by only mentioning the American and UK sacrifice, 900,000 war dead, you fail to honour the 50 million, some estimates put it at 80 million, other human beings who lost their lives during the conflict. Or don't we care about them? And if we don't, why don't we? Thank you. I just read before the break that I should do closing remarks and performance. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the only way to answer to you and what you did today, this afternoon, is that I recite a poem myself. Mm -hmm. A poem that is not too long, don't worry. A poem that I did not write myself. And I was thinking in the few poems I know, I know two about the today's topics. The first one is a, is a poem in Arabic language talking about the isolation of a lover in the great Saudi Arabian desert who sees that his beloved has left with her tribe and he starts to look for her on the desert. I will not recite this poem. <laughs> I, will, I will recite another poem because it fits even more to our topics. First, it's a topic, of, it's about isolation, because it's about an animal in a cage. It's about the lack of freedom, because it's about an animal in a cage. And it's about European identity, because the writer who wrote it was born in Prague, in the uh, hungaro austrian Empire, then uh, followed his love to Berlin and to Munich, followed his love to Russia, and uh, the poem was made when he was in Paris. So about European identity, I think this fits very well. I think our German colleagues know it because it's a very famous poem uh, by Rainer Maria Rilke, uh, Der Panther, the Panther. Maybe you know it too. If you don't know it, then read it in English because it's a really beautiful poem. And I try to remember. <laughs> <coughs> Der Panther. Sein Blick ist vom Vorübergehen der Stäbe so müd geworden, dass er nichts mehr hält. Ihm ist, als ob es tausend Stäbe gäbe und hinter tausend Stäben keine Welt. Der weiche Gang geschmeidig starker Schritte, der sich im allerkleinsten Kreise dreht, ist wie, ah, ist wie, hilft mir, Actually, I'm prepared. Yeah. <lacht> ist wie ein Tanz vom Kraft um eine Mitte, in der betäubt ein großer Wille steht. Nur manchmal geht der Vorhang der Pupille lautlos auf, dann geht ein Bild hinein, geht durch der Glieder angespannte Stille und hört im Herzen auf zu sein. Hi. Uh, well, it's been a great day, and uh, thank you for uh, coming, everybody. If you come, yeah. we just want to make a presentation. Susan, have you got that special gift? Uh, we've been working on a publication which incorporates most of what you've heard today, so we'd like to present you this, and there'll be more coming soon, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. That's, that's the first copy, that's the collector's item. Well, they're all collector's items. It's been great today. And uh, I know Nick would have been absolutely uh, buzzing with it. So, um, yeah. Uh, we're going to finish with, uh, there'll be a short video of stuff I filmed at Fox's, uh, the speakeasy we did in April, when you guys from Greece and Berlin came over and Nick had this idea to put bits of paper on all the tables and you could scribble down any ideas you wanted to about isolation, overcoming isolation and freedom. And then Nick and Becca who runs the cafe and uh, Kelly Davis read across the several ideas. You'll see that in a second. One of the ideas, somebody said isolation 
is like the ISS, meaning the International Space Station. But Nick couldn't read the handwriting and thought it was 155, which he interpreted to be a bus route. <laughs> so uh, I thought that was quite funny. And uh, I wrote this, and it's the view from the 155 bus. The 155 bus route is like no other, orbiting the Earth five miles a second with 92 minutes to do a lap of the planet. I look down upon the blue world below, a marble of turquoise and gold with streaks of white. There are no boundaries here, no countries, no border disputes, no lines in the sand, only land masses and islands. No man, woman or child is an island, but we are. But we're not. Look up. Open your eyes and see. Beyond the horizons and gaze upon the cosmos. Golden stars in a circle. But see that one. The odd one. The one that never fit in. The one that stood up to say their piece and took the flack. Because they were labelled a troublemaker. A maverick, more like. But this is no longer the world for mavericks. Only control freaks, psychopaths, and dictators thrive. Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. I'm stuck in the middle with you. Shine on, you crazy diamond. You're a star on the universal stage. That departing one, surrounded by a blaze of light, crashing out of the order of things, shooting star that burns so bright before turning cold to drift through dead of night forever. Welcome back to the Stone Age. Enlightenment is banished. The stars go out and shine no more. But there are those who remember, who recall a time before, at the genesis, the birth of the universe. We stuff this magnificent stuff, atoms, such stuff that dreams are made of. Our origins come from the galactic furnaces. You and I were born in the heart of a star. Relight my fire. The stars align. Fate will draw us together once more across the universe. For across the gulf of space, minds immeasurably inferior to ours caused a schism a break with reality. Our path is not fixed. We may go right, we may go wrong, but we have the choice to do just that. Watch out, world. Our star will shine again. And one day, perhaps, we shall shine together. Thank you very much. Read across, yeah? We'll start. Isolation is like, overcoming isolation is like. So we do it like three wise monkeys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Alright, so your second. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. To, yeah. Right, okay. okay. I can't That's figure it out. Yeah. 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 We have to finish by 10. So we're going to go before the end. And you don't know how little you get applauded. Hang <laughs> <laughs> on. Isolation is like, oh. The black page. We overcome isolation through human interaction. Freedom is like a dancing butterfly. Isolation is like not sharing your fears, feeling trapped, not having any something or other. What do you think that's a choice? Yeah, I thought it was chips. <laughs> Isolation is overcome through taking risks, reading, movement, loving yourself, communication. Freedom is like the ripples through the lake as you swim to the other side. Well, a baby, isolation is like a baby left at a church door. A polar bear adrift on an iceberg. Nothing else. Having a contagious disease. 
Isolation is overcome through love, passion and care, breaking your habits. Freedom is like Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Freedom of speech, ant milk, full, full fridge, freedom of expression, freedom of redundancy, being unwatched, being unwashed, a lung full of air, unconditional trust, shouting anywhere you want, freedom of emotion, nationalised railways, freedom from pain. Isolation is like... Being on the what's that? One five five. I think he's the boss. I say this is the loneliest kind of safe, empty fridge. No ant milk. Being afraid <laughs> to speak. A lack of dogs. <laughs> no internet connection. Needing the toilet during a play. The four walls okay. of your mind. <laughs> We overcome isolation through smart use of social media, inviting your neighbours to tea and sticky cakes, thinking of adventures, connecting with your surroundings, becoming friends with yourself and your moods, embracing it. Freedom is like an ideal. We enslave ourselves in a nine-to-five job to try and achieve. Freedom is like the prospect that anything can happen. Freedom is like walking unconcernedly through warm summer rain. But isolation is like a black hole that sucks you in to an unknown universe. You can't, guess what, find your way out of being an Everton fan in the cafe. <laughs> <laughs> Living on Christmas Island and not getting a Christmas present. <laughs> Asking if people saw the documentary on Ben Nevis last night when the conversation was about EastEnders. <laughs> Knowing you are powerless to stop an elderly relative <laughs> failing to recognise you. Being disconnected from other people in the world. Being the last tangerine left in the fruit bowl. <laughs> We overcome isolation through art, capital letters has to be loud, conquering fear, company of friends and family, drinking ant milk, Yay! kissing hands, <laughs> indulging our vices, positive thinking, betraying Jesus. <laughs> freedom is like the west wind. Freedom is like the second before jumping off a cliff. Freedom is like security. Isolation is like one isolated, two uh, looks like Londoners, three <laughs> or being a Londoner, three is disconnected, and four it's a vast emptiness. We overcome isolation through sheer bloody determination, making someone a cup of tea, eye contact, believing in yourself. Freedom is like a balloon you can't define. Isolation is like going to the park and there being no ducks or swans. <laughs> or like being stuck in a fridge or being down a well, but last can't save you. <laughs> <laughs> can't save you. <laughs> We overcome isolation through laughing at things together, joy in creativity, enjoying food together, gigs, connections, walking hills with people or alone. Freedom is like soul and purpose, life, having the possibility to change. Isolation is like ice, a window opening, to a wilderness of contentment, can't be. Well, it may be. I, isolation is like driving along, not knowing where you're going, not wanting to get there, 
with a craft work tape on a loop. <laughs> <laughs> it's all black and white. Yeah. Yeah. Freedom is like, not soli isolation is like, solitude gone wrong. Solitude gone right. <laughs> We overcome isolation through talking to people, yes, I know it's hard, but go for it. Giving up what keeps us alone. Freedom is like the eventual coming of spring and rebirth. Freedom is like swimming in the open sea. Isolation is like an island, for example, the Shetlands to the far north, or a cold bed sit in a big city, or screaming at the top of your lungs and no one even looks at We overcome isolation through mixing and melding physically and mentally with others. Communion with other human beings or animals. Going, doing, being. Freedom is like the sharp air breathed in on top of a mountain. Or new trainers. Or my bicycle. <laughs> or waking up in the morning know, knowing that you have no work you have to do. Yes. Or like walking a mountain ridge, doing a dance in front of speakers at a concert. Flying, dancing, singing. Sitting by the sea with the breeze running through your hair. Driving in your car with the top down. The scent of fresh cut grass. How we feel? Yeah, there you go, guys. I'll put it down as Homer. Right? Sorry, two minutes after ten, but that's not bad, is it? I'd like to say thank you to our guests, yeah, for staying and being so polite. <laughs> Macedonia and other places as well. So everybody, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.